Hello everybody. Uh, my name is Jamie McCormick. Uh, I've been doing marketing in the video games industry for quite some time. And uh, my talk today is going to be on shenanigans within advertising suppliers um, from my experience as a marketing manager. So, start off, anyone Irish in the room will know what shenanigans are? Silly or high-spirited behaviour or mischief? We're not going to be talking about this today. We're going to be talking about secret or dishonest activity or manoeuvring that can happen all across the advertising supply chain. So, uh, we have this in a story format. So, uh, back a couple of years ago, there was a relationship between a marketing manager of a Japanese video games company and an advertising supplier who was in Israel. Um, the marketing manager had a game that he was launching in 20,000 euro, uh, in which he was going to do it. And the unscrupulous advertiser shafted him and sold him a campaign that was 99% incentivized and a complete waste of money. So, this was in 2010. Uh, there was an international team of marketing managers covering English, French, German, Italian, Polish and Turkish markets. Uh, and all, uh, So we had five separate markets that we were covering. Each of those uh, campaigns, sorry, each of those markets had their own product mix. We had eight different games and then some three, some five, some eight. Uh, there's about 24 in total. Uh, we had budget divided between a dozen suppliers each per market, so it's pretty complex and we were spending a quarter of a million euro a month driving advertising into video games. So a fairly substantial amount of money uh, back at the time. The product itself in question was a nice little cute game called Dragonica. Um, it was a Korean product that used the free-to-play business model, which is now basically standard across the app industry. It had been released in 2009 on PC, and uh, we'd launched it in the EU English, French and German markets. So, this product had been licensed in three English versions, so there was North America, there was Europe, and then there was uh, Southeast Asia, so Philippines and Singapore and that kind of area there. And uh, a year later, we had our first major product expansion. We had, I think, 300, 400,000 euro of a marketing budget to launch this product, and then this was split equally between three different markets and our various different suppliers. So, we have a I can't name anybody, we'll call them Honestnet for the moment. So we've been working with them for over a year across various different campaigns in quite a small scale. Between these is added up to about $30,000. Uh, and we had developed what we thought was a foundation of trust with them as suppliers. We then met them in person at Gamescom. And Gamescom's in Cologne. It's the largest games conference in the world. It has about 400,000 consumers that go to it over five days. And basically, who's who of the, the games industry is there as well. So, their promise was they were supplying all of our competitors, they had years of experience in, in the sector in games, they had a large amount of volume, they had lots of publishers uh, from that volume was coming from. And we worked on a CPA basis primarily, so we were paying for registrations on the hope that these registrations would use the product and monetize a little bit later on. And one of their promises was we can switch this on, get you loads of people in because they had such a large capacity on their network. So when we got back to Dublin, had a couple of Skype calls, got the insertion order signed, provided them the links, gave them the assets, waited for the day to launch from uh, the producer, and that was kind of sitting in the can ready to go. So, overall, you know, what we were looking for with that 20,000 was 13,000 leads. This was double opt-in, for those of you who know that, that it's CPA. We were targeting a couple of dozen countries, and they were going to run this campaign over a week, seven days, really, to help drive a lot of people into uh, the launch period for the expansion. So, with our business model, it was very, very, very mathematical. You know, we could generally work all the metrics, all the conversion rates, everything else, and that's how we price everything. So, they were going to send us traffic, which is going to click, visit our landing page. They were then going to register, so you can register with email or Facebook or uh, open ID. They then activate, and there's a star there because that's what we were paying for. So we were paying about 160 a lead for that. Then what would happen next is the users would have to, or the players would have to download five gigabytes of the game. They then have to install that. Then they have to patch it up a little bit more, so it took them a couple of hours to do so. Then they'd log into the game, so they go through a user authentication. They'd create their character. They'd play. They'd level up. Keep playing a bit more, and eventually monetize. Now in this case here, we're talking about 12 to 15% of our users will monetize. They monetize up to about 100 euro each. Every product that we had monetized at different rates, but they were generally the same uh, as this. 
So the big day arrived, Thursday, when the game actually went live on servers. Um, at the time we didn't switch on marketing because our, our uh, patching servers were getting hammered. We had like 5 or 10 terabytes an hour going through. Uh, we were big fans of BitTorrent because it helped take the load off us as well. And then at the end of that day, the producer came into us and said, look, marketing, you've got that big first wave through, so please switch it on. So the next day, we'd, uh, we came in. HonestNet had told us that the campaign was live. We could see on their screens and their reports and in their dashboards that there was loads of registrations coming in. In our fairly simplistic stats as well, we could see the same, so kind of we were both happy. And then after a long week, having our PR team finishing doing their PR, community managers off their, you know, really going, doing quite a lot, all the advertising live, servers are hopping with players coming in, loads of good feedback, and then we all went to Bullen Castle for a couple of points. Now, Monday, we had uh, 10,000 leads according to the HonestNet platform. We sell out about 3,000 that were still due to be paid as well. And uh, the producer, he didn't storm in, but he was very loud and stampy in terms of coming into us, so we kind of knew he was coming. And obviously this has been sanitized a little bit, but it was, where the heck were my players? You know, we just spent 15 grand on an ca advertising campaign over the weekend. So, what do you mean? We thought we sent in 10,000. So he was expecting to have his CCUs doubled. So that's consecutive concurrent users. So he might have a thousand people on servers within a given time frame. He was expecting that to go up at least, you know, double or triple with the amount of people that we have coming in. And all he could see was his normal players that he got in organically or from where we had about eight million people on the portal at this point there. So we see no impact, significantly less than that. Again, quite sanitized. It was pretty uh, worked up that day. So we had to sit down and do something about that immediately. So the first thing we had to do was apply the emergency break. So we get onto HonestNet. Can you please pause the campaign? We didn't give them any answers. We just said, look, stop now. And hung up. They said that. Okay, can you elaborate? No. no. So, now, there was four or five digital marketing managers on the team, and we really had to put our investigation hats on to do this. So the first thing we had to do was really get a full report from our developers for every single one of those registrations that came in over the last couple of days. We had to do quite a lot of data analysis, nothing fancy, pivot tables, lots of data. In our case, we actually had to buy a new computer because there are so many rows in the spreadsheets that we had to get. Uh, brand new hardware for this to run on, and our PR manager was pretty happy because she got a review machine on the back of that as well. So we were able to get all the information, version rates on the clicks and the registrations and the analysis. Now from our game databases as well, we are able to look at behavioural cues. So in our case here, everyone who registered would have to log in first, then they'd have to create a character. Then if they bash things, they're going to hit level 1, and 2, and 3, and 4, and 5. And really we picked this as a big metric. Because for a player to become a player for what a producer wanted, they needed to hit at least level one, which showed that they got through all of our marketing into the product and were playing the game. After that, marketing's responsibility was finished, and it was up down to operations that she monetized them later on. So the horrific truth from these reports were that we had gotten 11,000 unactivated accounts. 90% of these, which was the 10,000, had activated their accounts, which triggered a CPA pixel of 160 a pop. And out of all of these people, less than 1% hit level 1. Pretty scary. So, back onto HonestNet, armed with the information, we uh, informed them that we wanted to have a talk about the campaign. And this is where it got really, really, really bitchy. Their first response was, sorry, you know, you didn't contract us for players. Even though that they you know, met other games industry, they promoted themselves, the whole thing, they just said, all we said we give you is someone who's filling in an email, filling in a password, activating their account. That's it. So, we said, well, that wasn't the understanding that we had your salesperson. We hired you for players. We met you at the largest games conference in, in, in Europe. And you promoted yourselves and continue to promote yourselves as one of the largest drivers of players into the industry. And they boiled back down to, hi, we're sorry we don't have your players but you hired us for double opt-in leads. On a CPA basis, the fact that they didn't turn into players is your problem. 
So, we weren't happy about that, obviously. We'd just been shafted with the campaign. Now, what had transpired was, they had taken our ads, they put them into, I'm sure people here are either familiar with Facebook games, and generally they have ways to monetize, and there's offers within them. So kids who don't have a credit card or money, they go in, they fill in an offer, then they get bongo points for whatever game they want to play. So what they done was, they put them into a load of those. HonestNet had taken 30% of every single lead that we were sending through, and our competitors had been taken 70%. On top of that then, kids were getting free credit from doing our campaign in another game, so that's why we never saw them again. And we got to pick up the bill, in this case here. So, in that particular case, they were correct in the contract. The insertion order did specify that we were looking for double opt-in leads, but this is where it's really important when you get your insertion orders right. Now, on the back of this analysis, we went back to our developers and said, hi, can you run the same report on every single supplier that we have? This report took four and a half days. We collected, I think, 800,000 pieces of information on different registrations that have been going back about six months, and we were able to identify among others, three who uh, three other ad and affiliate networks were showing a very similar pattern. who had been undetected beforehand. Now, with these, we were lucky. The program terms that we had specifically prohibited incentivized traffic. So, we were able to say, hi, are you going to give us our money back? Or do you want us to publish this information for what you've done? So, we got 50 grand back two weeks later. Now, on top of that then, with our current liabilities and our marketing budget, with those people, they'd been spending 30 grand. So we had 30,000 euro in the current month that was due to be invoiced to us as well. So we cancelled it. It's just like, all of this is full. In no way you're getting this as well. On top of that then, we were able to redistribute 40 grand to suppliers who were giving us exactly what we wanted, which meant that all of the metrics came out. Now, with some of our metrics, it, was, uh, it went down, other ones they went up. So our conversion rate dropped. So our primary conversion rate from click to registration dropped from about 40% down to about 15%, which is what it should have been. Secondly, our player rate went up. So when we took all of these out, instead of having three or 4% people going into the game, we actually now had 40% of people going into the game. And we were able to move the money around this way. So, there's a moral in the story. If you're a marketing manager, do not trust your supplier stats unless you have your own data to cross-reference them against. If you don't have this, it's nearly impossible to challenge them. Secondly, have tools to enforce your insertion orders. Every single piece of money in the advertising industry comes from an insertion order from a company that has given a marketing manager money who's risking their job to delegate that between different advertising suppliers as well. So once you have this information there, you can hold suppliers to your contracts or you can hold their publishers, so the websites that are linked to them, to theirs as well, and challenge them. So you have your money, they have to earn it, and you need to make sure that they're responsible. So this led to the creation of Project Chrysalis, which is a marketing middleware platform that we've built on the back of this methodology. So this experience is a very, very, very costly lesson for the company. Now we have been spending two and a half million euro a year on marketing. We we're getting direct ROI of 900 grand with all of this coming in. The first full year after we did this, we were able to spend two million and make two, break even on reduced spend, and the following year afterwards when we automated this was spending one and a half million and making three. So over the course of a three year cycle within a video games publisher, marketing stopped being a cost of the business and ended up being a profit center. So with Chrysalis, uh, we've designed it in a way so it gives people uh, the opportunity to avoid all the shenanigans that we came across, it gives you a better opportunity to challenge suppliers with better data that they have. So we had doing a Bitcoin talk there recently in the FinTech stage and we did a case study there, in which case 39% of the campaign was invalid traffic. And we challenged them, we had better data than their staff had, they got the money back and credited back onto the campaign. Now, all affiliate and advertising networks have a three-way relationship. You as a marketing manager are contracting the network. The network has members who are the publishers, and there's two different agreements in place between them as well. And these are enforced by contracts. So if you can't challenge them on your own contract with the network, you can challenge the publisher's contract with them for what they supply to them as well. So, and really, just from my experience, this is working in 
uh, games, apps, and Bitcoin sector as well. If you don't have the tools and you're quite naive thinking that this isn't going to happen, shenanigans do happen as well. So there seems to be very few people who are making a solution to reduce marketing spend. Most ad tech is made by advertising people. Advertising people want more and more and more money in. That's the counter to a marketing manager whose point is to maximize ROI from their uh, limited and finite marketing budget that's there as well. And there's so many people who are taking a cut along the way, it's ridiculous. But, you know, there is going to be a proportion of invalid traffic that can hemorrhage your marketing budgets as well. So what we do is we make sure that every single supplier that we have, we've got the data so that we can audit them at a very, very, very granular level across all the different channels that are coming in. We can identify forced traffic so we can instruct them to stop. If you tell a market, an advertising supplier to stop advertising, if they don't switch it off, you don't actually have a liability. You've, for, you've told them not to do that and you can actually challenge that later on as well. You can distinguish bot traffic, happens a lot, crawlers, various different programs that are trying to game the system. You can identify when publishers are clicking their own ads, it does happen quite a lot. And really it's about having proof to be able to challenge your suppliers with the data that they've given you as well and get the money back. So that's either getting a cash refund, getting liabilities that you did have cancelled, or redistributing that money to places where you're actually going to get better money coming in, and a lot more. So, nice and short and sweet. I know we're running over time. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, for listening and staying. Um, if there's any questions, happy to answer them. And otherwise, I know that Andy here is here up next after me. So thank you. Thank you.